In this video, we're going to do an example of energy transferring during the stroke of a piston. If I can figure out how to go between the slides. There we go. So what you should have done is you should have watched this video already on Veritasium. If you haven't done that, go back and do that. The link is in the big sheet. So here's our example problem. Uh, we have a three meters cubed of gas initially at STG. It's placed under a pressure of 4 atm, causing the temperature of the gas to rise to 28 degrees. So we want to know what the new volume of the gas is, and I'm just going to walk you through this process and I'll go over each one of those. So let's start with the new volume of the gas. To do this, we're going to lay out what we know. So these are the initial conditions of the gas. You have the temperature, which is STP, so that's going to be 273 Kelvin. The pressure is one atmosphere, which is 1,001 1, plus 300 pascals, and then three meters cubed. And then the second situation, we have a different temperature. We've gone up to 28 degrees Celsius, so that's 300 Kelvin. The pressure has increased. We want to know the volume. Now, it's the same, the same sample of gas, so we know that N, the number of moles, is the same. So we're going to use the things we know from snapshot A to figure out how many moles, then we'll plug it in in snapshot B to figure out the rest. So we have, um, we're going to use PV equals NRT. We isolate our unknown variable as always, and then we're going to plug in numbers and solve for the number of moles. So let's get rid of this. So uh, we have 134 moles. Now we can plug this in on the other side, also using PV equals NRT. And our volume now is the one we're isolating for. So we isolate our unknown variable, plug in numbers, and we get a new volume of 0.827 meters cubed. So we know that we've changed dramatically in our volume. We started with 3 meters cubed. Now we're going down to 0.827 meters cubed. Next, let's draw a before and after picture for this process, given the values and labeling um, the relevant variables. So here I've drawn a sample of gas. This is the system inside the gas. It's at STP. You can see it's at um, standard pressure and temperature. And then in the second situation in snapshot B, the piston has compressed the gas, because the, and we know that because the volume went down, the temperature went up, and the pressure went up. So now, under each picture, picture we're going to draw a qualitative, excuse me, quantitatively correct energy bar graph showing the energy stored in the system at this time. So we have our flow system um, in our system. We're going to say there's just the gas in the water, which will basically always be your system in these problems. Then we have the gas in the surroundings. That's the environment. So for our initial situation, we have internal energy, and let's just say two boxes of internal energy. And at the end, we know that we have more energy um, because the temperature went up, and we know that internal energy is dependent on the temperature. So we have an extra box there for the extra temperature. And we could uh, use an equation. The internal energy is 3 half times N, which is the number of moles, times R times the temperature. And we can plug in numbers and figure out what our internal energy is there. We can also do that for uh, snapshot B. For the internal energy, we have a different temperature, and then we're going to have a higher internal energy in the second situation. So we know that we have more energy here than we have here. Now, where does that energy come from? That's what we're going to explore next. Between the pictures, we need to draw an accurate PV graph for this process and use it to determine the amount of energy transferred into or out of the system by working. Now, we need to stop and think about this. This is really important to be careful with. Uh, our book and the AP are always going to talk about work done on the system by the surroundings. But you will see situations um, in different books and in different places where they think about the work done by the system on the surroundings for various reasons. But make sure you're really careful when you're thinking about this. We're always going to do the work done, the work that's being done on the system by the surroundings. So we're thinking about the energy entering the system through working. And it should be a positive value. 
in this case because the um, the piston, if you think about the piston pushing on the gas, the piston pushes to the left and the gas moves to the left. So that would be positive work because theta, the angle between the force and the motion is zero. Uh, so we're going to have um, positive work. So now we know that we're going to have work being added to the system. So we would put our little arrow showing our one block of work so that it all adds up. Now um, let's actually find out how much work there is. So let's draw a PV diagram. P is going to, pressure is going to be on the y-axis and volume is going to be on the x-axis. There's snapshot A plotted at 101.3 kilopascals and 3 meters cubed. And then there's snapshot B, which is um, 405.2 kilopascals and 0.827 meters cubed. We draw a line between them and we know that the, the direction of this arrow is really important um, because it determines if it's positive work or negative work. So we know that the volume is getting smaller. This is A and this is B, so we need to have the arrow going that way. And when the volume is getting smaller, you're going to have positive work. If the arrow were the other way, it would be negative work. You're always finding the area under the, the curve here to determine how much work there is, but you have to determine if it's positive or negative by which way the arrow goes. So we know delta V, change in volume, is equal to um, VB minus VA, and so we can do that calculation and get negative 2.17 meters cubed. Then we need to find um, so if we find the area under here, that's going to be the work done on the system. Um, and we know that at a constant pressure, work is just P times delta V. P times negative P times delta V, because if V is getting smaller, then work is positive. So that's why you need the negative there. So to find the area here, you can use the trapezoid equation or you can do a rectangle plus a triangle. Either one is fine. Um, the way that I've done it here is the rectangle plus the triangle. So we have PA, which is the height of this triangle, times delta V, which is right here, plus one half times um, PB minus PA, so that's the height of this triangle, times the delta V here. And that gives us um, a work value of, well, negative work is equal to negative 550,332. So we end up with work is just 550,332 joules. Now, just to be clear on the signs here, um, if the area, we know work is equal to negative P delta V. Because if your delta V is negative, you're going to have positive work. And if your delta V is positive, you're going to have negative work. So, because if, if the gas is getting bigger, then it's expanding. So the piston is pushing maybe to the left on the gas, but the gas is moving to the right. So that would be negative work. So you've got to have a negative sign in there on that. All right, so now when we go back to our numbers, if you look at the numbers, you might be like, wait a minute. This plus this does not equal this. So something else has to be going on here. We know that we have this initial energy plus our change, which is our work, that does not equal our final energy. So what are we missing? We're missing the heating in the process. So there must be some heating going on, some Q. So now we're going to um, use the bar graphs and the equation, the first law of thermodynamics equation, to determine how much heat we have entering or leaving the system. So we know that the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the initial energy of the system plus or minus all the energy flows or energy changes is equal to the final energy of the system. So in this case, we have um, initial energy plus change by working plus change by heating equals final energy. That's really what we have all the time. Uh, and so we're going to add our numbers in here. This is our initial energy. This is the work. This is the heat. 
and then that's our final energy. We can solve for Q and we get negative 503,558 joules. So that's how much energy is transferring out of the system through heating. So now it should all make sense. We have, um, oh yeah, okay. So now we go back and edit our energy flow bar graph, our LOL diagram. <laughs> and we have two uh, boxes of energy here. We do some working, adding energy to the system. We do some heating. So the system is releasing heat into the environment. And I'm sorry, the, yes, that's right. And then we have, so we have two plus three minus two equals three. And so that's all gonna work out. Now, you may think, wait a minute, how can the temperature of the system increase when it is heating the surroundings? Um, because it seems like if the system is heating its surroundings, then the temperature should be decreasing, right? Because it's giving off heat into the surroundings. But you have to remember that we have work and we have heating. So those two things cause the internal energy to change in your system. They cause the change in temperature. So if your system's increase in temperature, if your system increases in temperature, it can still be heating the surroundings as long as there's work being done on the system. Uh, and so that's our example.